Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. good morning. Good to see you all here today. Uh, welcome to Living Hope Wesleyan Church. We're glad that you're here today. Uh, we've got an exciting day for you, but I got to get through some announcements where, before I can share the exciting part. So, uh, first of all, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. Uh, those of you that are joining us online on our Facebook, uh, we're glad that you're here, we're glad that you're joining us, and it's just a, uh, a great way for us to connect even through, through Facebook. The other thing I want to let you know is that uh, we have a digital connection card that we would love for you to fill out. Uh, that's easily done through our website, lhwc.net. And then you want to look for the plugins, the plugins right down here in the corner. And uh, that allows you to get to our digital connection card. You can find that uh, on our website, lhwc.net. And then that uh, allows you to just uh, let us know that you're here. And that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, and anyone can fill one of those out, whether you are a visitor or you're a longtime uh, living hoper. We're just uh, glad that you're here. Um, another thing that we want to talk about, and this is probably what uh, some of you are, are really excited about today, is that we are bringing back for the very first time in over a year and a half, I think that's what it is, um, Fifth Sunday Lunch. So whew, it's, a, it's been a long time since we've been able to have lunch together. And so right after the worship service, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to set up some tables. Uh, if we can get some of the trustees to help us out with that, and then we'll, uh, we'll have lunch in here. Now, the thing that I'm really excited, I'm, I'm excited about the food. Food is great, right? It's always good. Get us uh, energized and ready for the day. But I'm excited to let you know and to have some of our leaders tell you what we have planned for this fall. And so uh, we're going to be sharing things about adult uh, life groups. We're going to be sharing uh, about the youth ministry. We're also going to be sharing about men's ministry. And then we're going to be sharing about our next gen ministries as well. And so this is a great, great way for you to find out more information about what's going on. Uh, our fall ministries will kick off somewhere around September 12th. That's when things will really, really get going. But we need to get the information in your hands so that you're aware of what's going on. And that's what we want to accomplish during uh, the fifth Sunday lunch today. Now, I realize that not everybody will stick around, and especially our, our people that are uh, watching online, they're not going to be uh, checking it out, so uh, they're not going to be here for lunch. So we'll update our website and get all that information out to them as soon as possible. So, um, so if, uh, if you can stick around, that would be fantastic. We'll, get, we'll let you get through about halfway through lunch, and then we'll start talking about the exciting things that we have going on. Mark your calendars for September 12th. What day? September 12th. Very good. You guys are really smart today. I really love it. Um, September 12th, 12th, we are doing a, uh, a co-picnic with uh, Hillside Wesleyan Church. There are two Wesleyan churches here in Cedar Rapids, uh, Living Hope and Hillside, and we're going to uh, join together on the 12th at Guthridge Park in Hiawatha, that direction, and uh, we're going to have a picnic together around noon. Now, in the coming weeks, you're going to get uh, more information about what is needed because we, uh, we're going to be helping out with that picnic. Part of that will be we need to have people sign up to help bring food. And so in the coming weeks, you'll be hearing about that even more. But we want you to get this on your calendar because we believe that this is going to be not only just a fun uh, event, but it, it's really a, a partnership that we have always had with uh, Hillside Wesleyan that we need to start working together on a few things. And so this is kind of a kickoff for that. And it's exciting. And I know that uh, the folks at Hillside are excited about it as well. The next thing I want to do is tell you about uh, September 18th. Guys, this is for you. September 18th, we're going to be having a men's breakfast. I want to make sure I got that day right. Yes, September 18th. And uh, that's going to be a men's breakfast. And you're going to be hearing about what is going on in men's ministry for Living Hope. And I would love it if all the guys in the church are there uh, because it's going to be really, really good. There's going to be some discipleship opportunities that are going to be really important for you. And so we would love for you to be there. Okay, 
Before I jump into the sermon, I would love it if we would just take an opportunity to pray together today and uh, ask God's blessing, not only on our time together, but on our just, uh, just this fall that we get going uh, in the church. So let's, let's pray together. Father God, we are so amazed at your grace and your mercy. It's by your great power and by the work of the Holy Spirit that we even have an opportunity for our transformation in our lives. Your saving grace, your work in us and through us. And Father, it is really the the process of sanctification that you work in our lives. And we are so grateful for it. And today, Lord, as we uh, hear your word spoken to us, the stories of lost Ness, God, will you just work in our lives today? But Lord, will you also uh, prepare our hearts for what this fall can be? From uh, our children to our adults and everyone in between, Lord. Uh, We want to be able to glorify you in everything that we do. And we desire, God, to be able to reach our community. And so, Lord, we just are so very thankful for these opportunities. Thank you that we have leaders in place And thank you that we have people that want to learn more about who you are and what you can do in our lives. And so, God, we just ask that your hands of mercy would be upon us in the coming weeks. Help us to have moldable hearts and minds and bodies and spirits so that you can make us look more and more like your son. We thank you. We love you. And in Jesus' name, amen. Do you remember first week I talked about uh, things that were lost? And uh, I mentioned the average amount of time that a person spends looking for lost things. Does anybody remember uh, how many minutes, how many seconds it was that people spend uh, looking for things that are lost? Too Mm. Too long is what I heard. Um, depending on, on who you are, you might uh, be looking for lost things all the time. I don't know. I'm not sure if you are a loser of things or not. That almost sounded really bad. Um, I don't, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know how long it is for you, but the average amount of time that a person spends looking for lost things is five minutes and 20 seconds. That's time that you will never get back because you are looking for the things that you lost. And did you know that 69% of people find other things when they're looking for the lost things? I know that I told the story beforehand, um, but there was this one story of uh, some friends of ours from years ago. Uh, The wife is looking for her glasses and just looking all over the house, goes out into the car, uh, looks for them, can't find them, and is really just searching and starting to get a little upset at her husband because he's not helping her at all. And all of a sudden he says to her, what are you looking for? I'm looking for my glasses, honey. Look on your face. There they were. She didn't even know. Maybe she she spent five minutes and 20 seconds looking for them. I don't know. But Jesus, Jesus tells us in Luke chapter 15, three stories about things that are lost. Uh, The first story was a lost sheep, a lost coin, and a lost son. And we've been looking at these parables and The thing that is amazing about this passage of Scripture, and I would encourage you to open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 15. Uh, If you don't have your Bibles, open up your Bible app and go to the events section in the Bible app, and you'll find Living Hope Wesleyan Church uh, right there, and you'll be able to uh, follow the passage of Scripture along with us. But Luke chapter 15, verses 1 and 2 says this, Now the tax collectors and sinners were gathered around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So here's, this is the background behind this entire story, three stories that Jesus is sharing. Jesus is just getting ready to teach, and all these folks that are not the normal listeners, not the ones that most people would associate being present wherever they were, these tax collectors and sinners, 
And the Pharisees and the teachers of the law are saying, look, look, there they are. These people, these sinners, these tax collectors. And if you remember what, uh, what was thought about a tax collector, they were like the worst of the worst. They were traitors. They were despicable. They were not liked by anyone. And the Pharisees are casting judgment upon judgment upon judgment on anyone that is around. And they're even casting judgment on Jesus because he is sitting with these people. Can you just picture that in your brain? That it's almost the distanced pointing finger. Look over there. Those people are sitting with this guy. Wow. Jesus tells three stories. Story of the lost sheep. Lost because of the nature of a sheep, right? Sheep are kind of dull. They don't pay attention to where they're at. They put their head down and they start grazing. And sooner or later, they're just off from the rest of them. And the connection is spiritually is that we are a sinful people. We as humans have a sinful nature to ourselves and we are lost because of our nature. And then there's a story of a lost coin, the lost because of neglect of the valuable nature of the coin. And the spiritual connection is, is that there is neglect of people in their own spiritual lives to put first things first to really value their spiritual relationship with God. And so they put it aside and they don't pay attention to it and it's just neglected and they become lost. And then a lost son lost because of choices that are made. And we looked at the first portion of this passage last week, the story of the, the son, the younger son that goes to his dad and says, basically, dad, I want my inheritance. And when he says that, he's basically saying, I wish you were dead so that I can have what's mine. And the connection is spiritually is that we make choices. People make choices that affect their spiritual life every single day. Today, we're looking at the, the story of the second brother. Sometimes the second brother, the, the, actually the oldest brother, doesn't always get told. He kind of becomes an afterthought. And I didn't want to do that in this passage because it's too important for us today to hear this passage of scripture. So uh, verse 15 or verse 25, let's follow along as I read it for you. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, what was going on? Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he, was, uh, he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look. All these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you have never given me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him? My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours but we have had to celebrate we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again he was lost and is found reading this passage of scripture I, I have just poured over it for for days at a time between all three of these stories and I saw something just now that is quite interesting and I'm going to share it in a little bit but I need you to know that even when we read the, pat, the word of God even on a Sunday morning there's something else that we catch there's something new that we see in the word of God in a, in a different light when we read it even though we know the passage of scripture God still speaks even on a Sunday morning, and he's reminding me of something. Uh, and if I don't say it now, I'm going to forget about it. Okay, so here you go. The servant recognizes who he is talking to. He is talking to the son of his master. And he tells him that your father has killed the fattened calf. 
He knows who the son is, but the son doesn't realize who he is. And I'll talk about that in just a little bit. Okay, whew, that was really, all right, good. Uh, we might on the surface wonder why this part of the story is even a part of the passage. Uh, but it's as if this series of par parables about the lost and the, uh, this son, the older son, is no different than the older and younger son, the coin or even the sheep, because the son, the oldest son, is lost. Make no doubt about it. He looks like he's got everything put together, but he is lost. He didn't wander off. He didn't reject what was going on. He didn't neglect anything, and he didn't go and spend time with wild living or anything like that. He didn't make those choices, he, but he did make choices that resulted in his being lost. So what are some of those choices? The first one that I want to talk to you about today is that he made a distinguished choice to be a slave instead of a son. Let's hear it in his language. Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. That doesn't sound like a whole lot of sonship is going on, does it? In his mind, his slaving away, he even admitted, was that he was being a dutiful servant. He did what he was told and never objected to it by doing what he was told. He didn't cause a revolt. He didn't do anything along those lines. He heard the orders. He did them, and he was dutiful. But this was not what he was supposed to be. He was born a son. Because of, of who he was born to be, he had a different relational possibilities because he was a son. He had an opportunity to do different things, but he didn't. He did the work of a hired hand working in the field, and he chose this behavior. He chose to behave like a hired hand. And this is how he acted. Even though the servant knew he, who he was, the servant told him who his dad was, but in the midst of it, he didn't want anything to do with it. And he's acting like a slave. And what does a slave do? What does a servant do? They have no care for what should be done or how things should be done. They just follow orders. Go here, do that job. Go there, do that job. Serve me here, serve me there. There's no relationship, but he was born a son. He was a child of the master, and he makes himself a slave. The next thing that he chose was he chose bitterness instead of celebration. He chose to be bitter about his brother. Actually, he doesn't even acknowledge that his brother has returned. Verse 30, but when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. He doesn't even consider that it's his brother. He just wants to put it all on his dad and calls him your son. He chose to be overwhelmed with bitterness for, for the choices of his father, his son, and he, he says it to him, the squandering of his money and his wealth. Never mind the fact that his behavior, his attitude is quite repulsive. His judgment, his resentment, and more. The brother has a chance to celebrate an amazing thing that has happened, that his brother came home. The one that was lost, the one that spent years away from fellowship and relationship with his family, coming back from the dead, basically. But this son wallows in his bitterness. 
like pigs wallow in the dirt and the mud. And in his judgmental attitude, he pays no attention to to what is going on in his own issues. He would rather point out other people's problems instead of realizing that he is no different. He is just as lost as his brother is. Now, let's think about this for just a moment. His bitterness is so much so that he calls his own brother out for his own hit for his mistakes and his failures but he can't even see his own he can't even see that he is filled to the brim with frustration with anger with bitterness and all of that and he chooses to follow that way instead of rejoicing that the lost has come home. His third choice is entitlement instead of participation. The older son decides to focus on what he believes he is entitled to and not what he could have been doing all along. And you can hear it in his voice again. Look, All these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. Kind of a a, a Pastor Chopper uh, translation would be, I did all this for you and you never even gave me the smallest goat. I know, it was really close, but you needed to hear it from my words, okay? I did all this for you. Look at it. The fields are planted and harvested, and I did it for years, and I didn't even get a goat to show for it. Now, I don't, I've never eaten a goat. It might be really good. I don't know, but that just is, that just seems really interesting, isn't it? He, he's more concerned about the things that he didn't get than the fact that he had the opportunity to participate in a relationship with his father because he was a son. A relationship that would be life-giving, but no, he's worried about what he believes that he deserves. Instead of participating in a relationship that would give him everything he ever wanted, he wants what he didn't get because he believes that he should have gotten it. Doesn't that sound like messed up beyond? It does. Absolutely. Because he has it in his mind that he deserves something for the work that he did. And because he doesn't get it, he's bitter and he's upset. And so therefore he is mad about it. Sounds really familiar in a lot of different ways. Because we live in an entitlement type of world, don't we? I... I I think there should have been an amen right there. Maybe. I don't know. Entitlement instead of participation. What would he have gotten if he would have realized that he could participate in life with his father? Fulfillment. Understanding that everything that his father has is his own. And spiritually speaking... Spiritually speaking, when we have an entitlement perspective in our own lives, we believe that because we prayed the prayer, God should should answer instead of realizing that his holiness is what calls the day. And we get to participate in his holiness because he calls us sons and daughters. And we believe that we should get something out of it. And that's not part of it at all. We get to participate because God invites us to be sons and daughters, and we get to relish in what he does in our lives, not what we deserve, because we deserve zero. Because we are once sinners. We've been saved by grace, right? Now let's take this story in and of itself, the the three stories You can imagine, can't you, that the way that the original listeners heard this portion of the story, they might have been a little bit upset 
a little bit bothered that the supposed obedient son, the oldest son that stayed home at the beginning, was probably received in a positive light because he didn't rebel. He didn't go and sow his wild oats. And many scholars and many theologians look at this portion of the story and the older son as a critique of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, that in many cases they would be considered to be the obedient sons while being uh, obedient to what was going on, their heart was not in it. They saw their relationship with God as an obligation, as something that they thought that they ought to do because they had learned it all about it. And so uh, if, I, if I know this, I should do this. And so therefore I will do it, but my heart's not in it. And the, the result is, is empty orthodoxy. Say it with me. Empty orthodoxy. What that's really saying is empty right thinking. That's what orthodoxy means is right practice, right orthodoxy. And it's right thinking, empty right thinking, empty practices of religiosity. And can you imagine what when Jesus is telling this portion of the story, what the Pharisees and the teachers of the law are feeling? He's pointing fingers at us, isn't he? Ha. Huh. No wonder they were upset with him, right? Can you imagine? Can you imagine if Jesus was here today? Would this be said of the church today? That we are full of empty orthodoxy? In many circles, this is exactly how the church is seen, as empty rule-following fanatics, zero reason for the devotion, no difference between a person that goes to church and someone that doesn't. How does that make you feel? Is it true of us? Is it true of this church? Is it true of you? The last thing, the last thing that I want in my own life is to look like the oldest son participating in the sense that I am being obedient, doing my duty, but empty. No life. Going through the motions. A river that is dry. A tree that has no fruit. This story, this story should impact us just as much as the Pharisees because it's calling us out of our Pharisee nature but to be a son or a daughter that is found. Because the father is still there. The father didn't abandon the first son and he doesn't abandon the second one. Did you see that? He still goes out to both of his children. The one son that was of the prodigal that was a long ways off, when he got into eyesight, who tucked their robes in their belt and took off running? The father did. And when the oldest son didn't come into the party and didn't start celebrating, didn't participate in eating the fattened calf, who comes out to get him? The father. And this father loves you, knows you, and wants you in the celebration. He does. He absolutely wants you to be a part of it. But we've got to give up our empty orthodoxy. We've got to give up our empty rule following and follow him with our whole heart, our whole life, our whole mind, soul, body, and strength, and fall in love with him. We can fall in love with the church, and that would be wrong. We need to fall in love with Jesus, Jesus alone. And I'm telling you, if that's not where we're at, we got to have a heart-to-heart with God Almighty and follow after him. So how do we wrap all this up? 
how do we wrap these three and a half, four stories together and put a nice bow on it? And what do we do with these stories of lost? First is this. We need to be keenly aware of our own lostness. If we've been found by Jesus, if we haven't been found by Jesus, what are we waiting for? I mean, honestly, if we haven't been found by Jesus, what are we waiting for? Second, we cannot afford to neglect our spiritual lives. Like the, the story of the coin. We can't put it off until another time. Honestly, from my own experience, later never comes. It doesn't. If we want to put off our spiritual lives till another day, till we get older, till this afternoon, till, till tomorrow, it never arrives because we always have something that will take priority. And I don't know about you, but this is the most important thing in my life is my relationship with him. Keep pursuing after him. We can't afford to neglect our spiritual lives. The importance of the coin in the story is that it was the most important thing in the woman's life. And this should be the most important thing in our life. Third, prodigals are everywhere. Prodigals are everywhere. And don't forget that you can play a part in helping a prodigal write the course. Whether it's a family member, whether it's a neighbor, a friend, a coworker, whether it's someone that you just met off of the street, you can play a role in a prodigal finding truth. I've met a lot of prodigals. And by speaking truth and trusting God, many prodigals come home. Fourth, let's not get so focused on right thinking, following rules, that we miss out on the transformation that Jesus wants to do in our lives. Now, I don't know how the rest of the story plays out, but what we saw with the youngest son was that when he came home, he got a ring on his finger, he got sandals on his feet, and he got a robe put around his shoulders. Now, if the oldest son really was living as a slave, what do you think he got? I don't know. I'm not, this is complete conjecture and speculation. But once he came back home and realized who he was, maybe he went into his room and he put his ring back on. He put his sandals back on his feet and a robe because he was realizing that he is a son. For us, we can't, can't miss out on that transformation that he wants to do in our lives. Let's keep pursuing him. Keep pursuing him. Our lostness is is not something that we need to hold on to, but we need to hold on to our foundness, that we are found by God Almighty, and we are filled by His Spirit, and we are empowered by it to pursue Him. I'm going to take a moment and just a, just a little, and like in 30 seconds, and I'm going to pray. And this is what I would like you to do. I, we're going to give you just a few moments of just some, some soft music, and I, I want you to do some business with the Lord this morning. We're going to give you a little bit of time just to, to pray before the Lord. I'm not going to coach you in any way today other than you know where your own heart is at today. And you need to spend a little bit of time with God. Maybe it's asking for forgiveness. Maybe it's confessing that you're lost and you want to be found. I don't know, but I want to give you just some moments as uh, we have some soft music coming up in the background. And we're going to close our time with worship. But just want to give you that little bit of time. So go now. Spend some time in prayer. Those of you that are joining us at home, silence everything around you and just spend some time in prayer before the Lord. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.
Father, this morning we're encouraged, maybe challenged, by these stories of lostness as we kind of wrap this series up together. What's amazing about it, God, is that uh, we can identify with the various lost things in these parables. We can identify with the sheep, the coin, and the two lost boys. What I'm thankful for, God, is that today we have an opportunity to realize our own lostness and know that we are not forgotten, but that we can be found. And that through your power, through your work in our lives, through your calling and your seeking, we can be found. And we can have a relationship with you that is vital and life-giving. We can participate in the joys of the work that you do in us. And Lord, we can also celebrate in our being found. Lord, I thank you that even now there might be someone that is acknowledging for the very first time that they are found. And we're rejoicing in heaven. We're enjoy rejoicing here and now in being found. Thank you, God. Thank you for the prodigal that returns home. Thank you for the neglected spiritual life that says, I desire to be vital again and to be alive and to be found. And God, I thank you that we can also realize that maybe we got lost in trying to do instead of just being. And that's where that son was. He was trying to do the dutiful thing, but he forgot that he just needed to be a son. And Lord, I pray that we would hold on to that, that we would be just be a son and daughter and that we would live life with you that we would pursue you, that we would walk with you, that we would enjoy the things that you call us to. And so, God, I just, I thank you for that. I really do. And, Father, I pray that your work in us never stops because you never stop working. You always are working in our lives, and we thank you for that, God. And as we pursue you today, Lord, Will you just answer our call? Will you welcome us in that relationship? Will you walk with us? Will you guide us? And will you just pick us up like a father does and hold us so that we can know that you are present? You always are. And we thank you for that, God. Thank you for your love for us that you never stop seeking. And we pray these things in your son's holy name, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Just want to say thank you so much for joining us for, for worship today. It's, uh, it really is a joy for us to gather together. And uh, when we get done singing the next two songs, I uh, invite you to just stick around and, and uh, join us for lunch. I know that uh, there's going to be plenty of food for everyone. If you, if you arrived and you forgot that it was Fifth Sunday lunch, or maybe you didn't even know, that's fine. There's going to be plenty of food. So stick around and join us. We would love for you to, uh, to be here with us. Um, just remember that, uh, that in the midst of what the world is dealing with and the chaos that is going on around us, we have a Heavenly Father that loves us and desires to be in relationship with us. Even when there are wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes that are ravaging countries, 
God is still good in the midst of those things. And I'd invite you to keep on praying uh, for the people of Haiti and the people of Afghanistan. Let's stand and we'll worship together.